to our Palm Sunday service. To those who are joining us online, the best way to watch online is from that link on our website. If you go to the, uh, the homepage, there's a watch us online, obviously enough, and just click on that and uh, you can get the whole service that way. Uh, if you are uh, visiting with us today, we have some uh, welcome forms uh, on the back of the pew that you can grab and fill out for us. Online, uh, there is a connect button uh, for, uh, to give that information, so please uh, do that and forward that to us. We appreciate that. And we welcome you here today to this time, a very special time this morning for we welcome someone into the life of the church. So I believe our pastor should be ready by now. And there he is. Thank you, Roy. Good morning, congregation. It is so good to be together with you today as we celebrate Palm Sunday, as we celebrate God's uh, gift of his son, Jesus, as we celebrate the new life that we find in Christ. Um, baptism is something that we do as a church to symbolize uh, the new life that God gives uh, to us as his people when we put our faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus died, he was buried, and he rose again three days later. And so baptism is a symbol of the death and burial of res resurrection of Jesus Christ. But it's also a <laughs> symbol, a statement uh, to the world that says we have chosen to follow Jesus, that we have chosen to identify with him, that we have received the gift of salvation that is in Christ, and that we, like Jesus, have died to the old life and are resurrected for the new life. Uh, this is Daniel. He's no stranger to any of you. He's been here with us for quite a while, and he has given his life to follow Jesus. So, Daniel, I ask you, have you made your commitment to follow Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes, I have. Then on uh, profession of your faith in Jesus Christ, it is my great privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, buried with him in the likeness of his death. And raised to walk in the newness of the life that Christ gives. We celebrate our brother. Let's pray together and pray for him. Father, thank you so much for the new life that you give us all in the name of Jesus. Thank you for his death, his resurrection. God, let us live out this resurrection life. We pray for our brother Daniel. We pray for his family. We pray for the witness that he will be to your son. Let the true, full life that you have for him through your Holy Spirit uh, bless in every way, conforming him to the image of your son, that Daniel would be like him in all respects and be that witness of the new life that you have given us. We give you the praise and the glory in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. In Zechariah 9.9, 9, it says this, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of the donkey. Our first song today commemorates that ride. stand and sing. Ride on, ride on in majesty. Hear all the tribes Hosanna cry. O Savior meek, pursue your road with palms and scattered garments strode. Ride on, ride on in majesty, in lowly pomp, ride on to die. O Christ, your triumphs now begin, O captive death and conquered sin. Ride 
Ride on, run to die, ride on to die. Then take, O oh Christ, your power and reign. Ride on to die, ride on to die. Ride on, ride on in majesty. Host of angels in the sky look down with sad and wondering eyes to see the approaching sacrifice. Ride on, ride on in majesty. Your last and fiercest strife is nigh. The Father on his sapphire throne awaits his own anointed Son. Ride on to die, ride on to die, then take, O oh Christ, your power and Ride on, ride on, in majesty, in lowly pomp, ride on to die. Bow your meek head to mortal pain, then take, O oh Christ, your power and reign. Ride on to die. Ride on to die, then take, O oh Christ, your power and reign. Up. Up, O oh powers, above all kings. Above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man, you were here before the world began. Above all kingdoms, above all thrones, Above all wonders the world has ever known. Above all wealth and treasures of the earth. There's no way to measure what you're worth. Above all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man, you were here before the world began. Above all kingdoms, above all thrones, above all wonders the world has ever known, above all wealth and treasures of the earth, there's 
there's no way to measure what you're I am so thankful for the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, that God cared so much for our lowly estate, cared so much for us who were held captive in sin, that he sent his own son Jesus, king of the universe, the one by whom and for whom all things were made, this Jesus he sent. He sent to save us. He sent to redeem us. If you're keeping up with the readings in John, it said uh, just recently Jesus talking to his disciples on that night he was betrayed, saying, look, the world needs to know that I do exactly what my Father commands. The God of the universe loves you and gave the order, gave the command, and Jesus came. It's time for our youngest worshipers uh, to come down front. Hey, Liam, you look pretty excited to come on down. Anybody else who wanted to come, come join us for a minute. Good to see you guys. Now, today, this Sunday, is a very special Sunday. Does anybody know what Sunday it is? I got a hint. I got a, you do? Palm Sunday. Do you know what these are? Palms, well, they're, yeah, they're palm branches, palm branches. So would everybody like to hold one? See what they're kind of like? Pass one down, would you like to hold one? Well, they're probably from a store, but they come from palm trees. Um, you don't want to hold them? You want to hold one? Okay. You don't, would you like to hold one, Hezekiah, for me? Would you like to hold one? Yeah. Oop, there you go. They're kind of big. We have to be careful with them. So. I'm going to tell you a story today. In the, in the Gospels, in the story about Jesus, on the day when Jesus, the first the week before he was crucified, Jesus came to town. And all the people were expecting Jesus to come. And they thought he might come to town riding like a big king on a big horse. But he didn't. Jesus came riding on a donkey. But all of the people wanted to be very excited for the king, and they didn't know what to do, and they didn't have a big red carpet. So you know what they got? Palm branches. And they laid them down, and they waved them in the air, and they said, Hosanna, which means save us, save us. And that's exactly what God did. He sent his own son, Jesus, as the king to save us. And so I want to see if we can do it kind of like they did back then. Do you think you could wave the palm branches in the air? Let's go. Let's, let's see. Do you think the people out there can do it too if they have palm branches? Let's see if, see if everybody's... Yeah. We have to be careful because we don't want to wave it into somebody's eye or something. But um, that's exactly how it goes. They were waving. They said, Hosanna to the king. The king comes. All right. Well, let's pray and thank God for our king, Jesus. And then we're going to go to our children's time. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you for sending the king to come and save us. We pray all of this knowing how much you love us in his name. 
the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. If you'll go with Miss Ellen, if you'll follow her right there, and Miss Cody, um, you can go with our children's time. Thank you, guys. David's going to come, and he's going to lead us in a time of prayer. And I hope that your heart is ready to receive the king today because Jesus comes, and he comes uh, that we all might continue to worship him. He's come to save. He's come to change our lives. He's come to make a difference in every one of us. Are you ready for what Jesus wants to do in your life today? David, come and lead us in some prayers. Well, good morning, Valley. Good to see you all here this morning. I um, wanted to share uh, just a few things, uh, just things we've been praying for. Those, those were, we're praying for those with health needs, and it, it's good to see our, our college students back. And we, we, heard, we heard some good reports from uh, their, their beach reach trip. Uh, and so we'll continue to pray for just the fruits of those things. And uh, so let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer um, during this time. Father, we thank you for today and the, and the day that we celebrate we remember the day when you sent your son and he walked in and was greeted triumphantly and is set up for the, the, the great tragedy of the, of the cross. And uh, Lord, we thank you for the work that you've done and the work that we are, we're going to celebrate and remember this week, how you died on the cross and rose again. And Lord, we, we are grateful for how you continue to work in our hearts and, and use us as your people. Lord, we're praying for those that have health needs, and uh, Lord, we are, we are praying for uh, several within our congregation, within uh, families, and Lord, we're, we're, we're thankful to, to see Jeremy here today, and we continue to pray for him, and uh, we're praying for, for, for Kathy Roberts' sister and, uh, and her family and some other health issues there, Lord, for my mom. Um, Lord, there, there, are, there are many others with health needs. Uh, we're thankful that you, that you work in lives and that you touch hearts, Lord, that you bring healing to us. We're thankful for our, uh, our college students being back safely and uh, the good reports we heard about the, the Beach Street trip. And we're praying that you continue to work in the hearts of those that, that heard the good news, the, the hearts of those that put their faith in you. And we pray that you would, you would, you would strengthen those, those, new, uh, those new, new believers Help them to get connected with those that can help them grow. Uh, Lord, we, we continue to pray for, for our college ministries and the, the work that's going on there this semester, that you would strengthen uh, Mike and Barry and Rachel for the work that they're doing and uh, both Towson and UMBC and the, and the work that continues to go on through, uh, through this ministry here. We pray that you would equip us or help us, to be, help us to be strong, help us be ready, help us be bold to reach others with the good news. Lord, I pray that you continue to bless the rest of our service and you speak to us today as you give wisdom to, to Pastor Mike as, he's, as he preaches. Lord, may your spirit challenge and convict our hearts. And may we encourage one another in our time of fellowship and in our time around your word and Bible study today as well. Thank you for all these things. We pray these things in the name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. rise for one more song of worship. When I survey the wondrous cross on wings of prince of glory died my riches gain I count but lost and poor contempt on all my pride see from his head his hands his feet Sorrow and love for me go down. Did ever such love and sorrow me? Old thorns composed so 
Thank you for, to our musical leadership and, and how they bring us to that place of worship. Um, as we sing a song, Oh, the Wonderful Cross, it, it, it kind of almost strikes me as odd. I mean, I mean singing about the cross, our, our, of course, we don't worship the cross. We don't worship uh, this, this object of Roman torture, this object, this, this instrument of, of intimidation, of creating fear in a population, of creating incredible excruciating pain and ultimately death as a means of an execution. We don't worship the cross, but we're amazed by the cross. We're in awe that the Son of God would be placed upon a cross, who would endure the torture, who would endure the shame, who would endure the ridicule, who would endure the agony, who would endure, Scripture says in Hebrews, 
scorning its shame, that he might ultimately achieve for us salvation and obtain the right hand of the Father and be there forever. We come to the cross today. We come to think about the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus today. We come because in it, God fully demonstrates his love toward us in this, that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Let's pray together and ask God to speak. Father, thank you for the cross. Thank you for how you have given your son's life for ours, that you have given him as Savior, as King, and not leaving him there, but in the grave. Uh, Jesus took his life up again for our salvation. God, thank you so much for <laughs> this season to remember what your son has done for us. Help us today. Help us think. Help us remember. Help us respond. We pray this all in the name of Jesus. When you think about the Easter season, Good Friday, Holy Week, all of these kinds of things, I don't know if you have a sense of awe or a sense of wonder or if you change your habits um, at all for Holy Week, for Easter Week. For those of you guys that are avid pickleball people, there is no pickleball tomorrow night. It's Holy Week. We're kind of taking a week where we're not doing pickleball. I know that some of you are like, oh, I, really, I like it too, but you know, take, we're taking a break. How do, you, how do you spend Holy Week? What, what, what do you do? It's not spring break for me. I got to go back to class. Anybody got to go to work? Anybody feel like it's going to be just as busy, if not busier, than all the other weeks? What, what makes it holy for us? How do we enjoy? How do we reflect? How do we spend time thinking about what God did? Because it's not this week. I mean, it's 2,000 years ago that Jesus was placed upon the cross. And th these events happened so long ago uh, th that we almost can get a place where we're disconnected from them, where, where we seem in the busyness and the regularity and the urgency of the items in our own life that we forget and we don't take time to stop, to remember, to honor the sacrifice of Jesus the King. So to help us this week, we're going to look back at the cross. We're going to look back in, in this sermon series on the march to the cross. We're, we're going to help us think about the cross. And when you think about the cross, what do you actually think about? What actually goes through your mind? Is it something that we can sing, oh, the wonderful cross, but we're not actually thinking about the cross. We're thinking about what's happened. Have I got lunch prepared? <laughs> Are we thinking about something else today? What do we think about when we think about the cross? Well, I think first, one of the things that helps us is to think about the chronology, right? The events of the cross, the things that happened. It says, very early in the morning, the chief priests with the elders and the whole Sanhedrin, they made their plans. What had happened? Very early in the morning, a trial had taken place. Jesus had been moved from the Sanhedrin, which was the highest Jewish court of the land, the court of, uh, of the religious leadership over all the religious affairs of the people. Who was to be worshipped? How was God to be worshipped? What was to be done? This Sanhedrin spent time at night when no one else could see for some secret trials. Oh, they sent Jesus to Herod, the Roman ruler. Oh, they were about to bring him before Pontius Pilate. Oh, they, 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 they bound him. They, they'd taken him to these places. These, these chief priests, these elders, these teachers of laws, these who should have been expecting the king. Oh, they had their own agenda. They had their own plans. So they bound Jesus and led him away and handed him over to Pontius Pilate the Roman governor, who himself took Jesus through a time of trial. Verse 12, Pilate, 
He doesn't find anything wrong with Jesus. There's no reason for him to be accused. There's certainly no reason for him to be put to death. And so Pilate asked this to the crowd. He says, what shall I do then with the one you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out. They shouted, crucify him. Crucify him. This one who actually was the king of the Jews. This one who was king of the entirety of the universe. Paul, the apostle, tells us this, that by him and for him the universe was made. He is the head of the church, the firstborn among the dead, so that in all things, he says in Colossians, Christ might have supremacy. This one who Pilate actually calls correctly the king of the Jews. What should we do with him? And the people just say, Crucify him. Crucify him. Do you, any of these events kind of resonate in your life? Are we those who put Jesus on trial? Are we those who, who take God's plans and God's agenda, what God wants to say? No, no, no. We've judged it wrong. We've judged him as unworthy. We've judged that Jesus should not have central king lordship place in our lives. Instead, put him somewhere else. Just crucify. They cried out for a literal crucifixion. Pilate in verse 14 says this. Why? What crime has he committed? Asked Pilate. But they shouted louder, crucify him. There was no answer. There was no crime. There was no offense. The Lord of love, the one who came to bear our burdens, to take up our sorrows, the one who healed the sick, who raised the dead, who gave his life, who fed the hungry, Jesus our King, crucify him. Crucify him. Put him away. So wanting to satisfy the crowd, in verse 15, Pilate released Barabbas to them, and he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. The flogging wasn't a simple thing. The flogging <laughs> wasn't just a, 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 a spanking to get our child's attention. The flogging was taking the Roman cat of nine tails, a whip that, that had upon the leather straps pieces of bone, pieces uh, of rock, pieces of any kind of metal that, that they were taken and just lashed across the back till the flesh was ripped from the back. The pain, the agony, the seriness, uh, just, just agony of, of this is, is unbelievable to us. Oh, we might see it in a movie. Oh, we might see it uh, reenacted. But it's a horror that we have never really encountered in our lives. The idea that they had Jesus flogged and then handed him over to be crucified. And the flogging, if it wasn't enough, just to have him beaten, have it just the blood running down his back, having those open sores, those open wounds that were struck again and again, well, the soldiers made it even more cruel. Look at verse 16. The soldiers, these Roman guards who led Jesus away uh, into the palace that is called the Praetorium, and they called together the whole company of, of the soldiers. Not just a few. Not just what was necessary. But let, let's let everybody get in on the act. Let, 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 let's make this an event. Let, 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 let's call out all the people. Okay, come on, guys. This is going to be a good time. And we're, we're going to really tear up this man. We're going to hurt him. And what did they do? Well, in verse 17, they put a purple robe on him. They, 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 they twisted together a crown of thorns, these symbols of royalty, these symbols of kingship. And in fact, he was king. And they began to call out, Hail, King of the Jews. You understand this was not sincere. You understand that this was not for Jesus' benefit. You understand what they were doing. They were mocking. Verse 19, it says they struck him again and again. They had already whipped him. They'd already flogged him. But now, just to be cruel, they spit on him, falling on their knees. Oh, they paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they took off that purple robe and put on his own clothes, and they led him out to crucify him. Could you imagine the audacity 
of these guards. These ones who for sport just wanted to be cruel, taking the Lord of lords, the king of kings, beating, spitting, mocking. Scripture tells us in Philippians chapter 2, talking about us, saying that we, we, should have attitudes that are like Christ Jesus. It says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, it says, your attitude should be the same as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God. God. Did not consider equality with God something to be held on to or grasped, but made himself nothing, taking on the uh, very form of a servant, taking on the appearance of man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has exalted him at the highest place, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and in earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. These soldiers who fell on their knees, who with mocking voices said, Hail, King of the Jews, who found some, some robe that they must not have cared too much about, probably was already dirty. He wouldn't have wanted to put it on that bloody back, put this robe on him, put the crown of thorns on his head, pressed him down, make sure that the blood runs, make sure that the pain is excruciating. These ones who spit on him and hit him, mocking, hail, king of the Jews. There will be a day when every knee including theirs, will bow. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I honestly can't believe what was happening. I, it's hard for me to understand how Jesus could endure those kinds of things. I, I, I think I so often want to stand up for my rights. No one's going to disrespect me. Anybody kind of have that attitude? You can't, uh, 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 you're not going to treat me like that. And yet our king, the Lord of all creation, endured the shame, endured the mocking with the physical abuse that came from these soldiers. I, 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 I can't even wrap my mind around it. Well, after they had beaten him to the point of exhaustion, beaten him to the point where he could barely stand, they brought Jesus, it says, to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. This is where they crucified many of these Roman uh, prisoners, uh, many Jewish people who, who Rome had, had seen as uh, criminals or, or insurgents or anyone who opposed their power or uh, what they think was power. They offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he didn't take it. He didn't and take the one numbing agent, but instead he took the full weight of the pain. He took the full weight of our sins. And it says in verse 24, they crucified him. The words don't do justice to taking the broken, beaten Savior of the universe and stretching him out on a piece of wood. Not, not, not a nice, smooth piece of wood like our, our pews here, but a rugged stick, piece of lumber, jagged, pressing him upon that, stretching out his hands, pulling out his legs, taking nails and piercing his hands and his feet again and again and again as they drove the nails into his body to hang him on that pole, that cross. They crucified him. And if that weren't enough, the cross is then lifted up where his weight becomes agonizing. The pain, you can't even get the, the, the air into your lungs without being able to push up against the nail in your feet to get enough uh, uh, altitude there, to get enough height to get the air into your lungs over and over again. When would it have been enough? <laughs> when did this King of Kings and Lord of Lords, how did he endure? 
How did he not call down legions of angels to pull himself down? How did the God of the universe endure to show his love for us? They crucified him, dividing his clothes, as the scriptures foretold in Psalm 22, dividing his clothes. Uh, they cast lots to see who would, would, what the soldiers would get. Verse 25, it was nine in the morning. Wait, wait, only nine? Only nine? Already the, the trial? All night? Already the beatings had happened? Already the crucifixion? It's only nine in the morning. What a day. That they wrote a charge against him, the king of the Jews. There were other mocking voices. Verse 27, they crucified two rebels with him, uh, two, two thieves with him, one on his right, one on his left. These also hurled insults. Verse 29, those who passed by, they hurled insults at him, shaking their heads saying, hey, you were going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days? Why don't you come down from the cross and save yourself? They, they, they use a phrase they don't even understand to try to accuse Jesus. Verse 31 in same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, they mocked him. And look at the mocking words. He saved others, but he can't save himself. I, I, I can't even wrap my mind around that accusation. Oh, <laughs> he healed people. <laughs> can't heal himself. Oh, oh he saved people. Can't save himself. <laughs> no. Jesus immediately could have saved himself. Jesus could have helped himself. They, they, they heap these insults on him, but it doesn't even make sense. You're accusing him of helping people. You're accusing him of healing. You're accusing him of raising the dead. You're accusing him of salvation and bringing salvation to families and people all across the land. And now that's somehow your insult? Verse 32 let this Messiah, they said, let this king of Israel come down from the cross that we might see and believe. Those who were crucified with him, they also heaped insults on him. And at noon, after three hours of enduring the pain, enduring the pushing up to get the air, the enduring the constant insults, darkness comes over the whole land And at three, until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi. Lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, does this mean that God actually forsook him? Does this mean that God turned his back? Does this mean that he was enduring the full weight of the sins? Absolutely, the full weight of the sins. The rest we know is a prophecy from Psalm 22, which David says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus says the same, uh, King David says the same words, penned the same words a thousand years before Jesus' crucifixion. And in that Psalm, it talks about casting lots for his clothes. It talks talks about piercing his hands and his feet. It talks about all the people who were surrounded him and, and accused him in these ways. And Jesus is even then witnessing, you are fulfilling scripture. You are finishing the work that God has intended that I would endure. Jesus was faithful to the end. Jesus was faithful to accomplish God's plan. Jesus fulfilled uh, all of the prophecies about the Messiah. Jesus was bringing salvation and nobody saw it. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, this one who had mocked him, this one who had beaten him, this one who had crucified him said, surely this guy really was the son of God. What do you think about when you think about the cross? What do you think about when you hear, they crucified my Lord? What do you think about? Do you remember his sufferings? Do you remember the abuse? Do you remember the shame and the agony? Do you remember the torture? We need to think about what Christ has done. Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews tells us, we need to pay more careful attention so that we don't drift away. When I remember what my Savior did and how my Savior died upon that cross, 
then what sacrifice on my part becomes too great? What, 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 what response is enough from me that I could never repay the gift that God has given? Today, we don't have a lot of fancy stories. Today, we don't have a lot of distracting thoughts. All it is is one thing. Do we remember the events of the cross? How do you celebrate Holy Week? How do you celebrate? How do you think about and commemorate what our Savior did? For me, it's stopping to take enough time to remember what Jesus did for me what Jesus did for you. Have you taken time to think about the cross of Jesus Christ, the events of that, that fateful day when he when it was faithful and faithful, where he took the sins of the world through his death? What do you think about for the cross? Are, is it the events? We need to take time to think about the events. But we also need to remember that these were not just actions of some God who was cruel, who wanted to just make his son endure awful things. No, that's not true at all. These were the events that brought our salvation. We, when we think about the cross, we need to think about the theology. We need to think about the truth of the cross. We need to think about what the cross accomplishes. Let's look back at the story. What did it say when they said in verse 18, Hail, King of the Jews. Hail, King of the Jews. They didn't just mock him. They were actually speaking truth. Jesus is King. He is Lord of all. He is the one that God has promised all the way through his scriptures. I remember the, probably the biggest transformation in my life happened when I, I just, it was me, God, and the Bible. And we just spent about six weeks together. And God began to show me the prophecy and fulfillments, all the places in the Old Testament that spoke about Jesus, the coming Messiah, the coming King, the one who would come to save his people, the one who would come to bring new life. What we celebrated in baptism this morning is a reality that God has been telling from the very beginning. We need to remember that Jesus is the King. He is the Messiah. We need a Savior. Um, one of the groups was talking to me a little bit about studying the book of Judges. In the book of Judges, there's all kinds of heroes but they're all pretty bad heroes. At the end of the book of Judges, everything goes badly, and, and it says Israel had no king, and everybody did what they wanted. The very next book is the book of Ruth. At the end of the book of Ruth, there's, oh, and Obed became the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of King David. There was this two books that happened during the same time period in Israel's history. One says they didn't have a king and had no hope, and the other says... A king is coming. It's a Bible truth. God has been speaking all the way through. There's a king who is coming. There's a savior who is coming. And in the midst of a, of a, of a world right now that is torn apart by war, by political division, by racism, by hatred, by violence, in this world, I'm here to tell you, a king is coming. A king is coming back. A king is coming to make things right. A king is coming to transform lives. A king is coming to change you and to change me. For those of you who are struggling with addictions, for those of you who are struggling with despair, for those of you who feel like you're hopeless and have no way of reconnecting to God or family or anything else, we have a king. My family is going through some things, and there's some things that I like uh, brought to the prayer meeting on last Sunday night. I said, this is new for us. We don't know what's going on, and I don't know how to solve it, and I don't know how to fix it. So let's go to the king, because there is a king who has an answer. There is a king who can change lives. There is a king who's coming. The theology of the cross is the thought theology of a savior. The one they cried out, Hosanna, and waved their palm branches. You're king. Uh, son of David, come save us. He did that very thing through his death on the cross. Oh, it was unexpected. Oh, they didn't understand it. And they certainly didn't deserve it. And neither do we. But we have a king, a king who has come.
and a king who is coming back. The centurion was correct when he said, surely this is the son of God. This is the one who is sinless, who is perfect, God's one and only son. Jesus himself said, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever puts their faith in him would not perish, but have eternal life. Because just as, and this is in the same speech, Jesus says, just as Moses lifted up a snake in the desert, so the son of man, meaning himself, would be lifted up, lifted up on the cross, that everyone who would look to Jesus would be saved. He is the son of God. He is the king of the Jews and the king of all. And he is our great high priest. Did you hear in the story when Jesus gave up his last, when Jesus gave his last breath in verse 38, it says this, the curtain of the temple was torn from top to bottom. This was the temple that only the high priest could go into the back holy of holy place, this place that represented the presence of God. He could only go one time a year on the day of atonement. And on that day, he would offer sin sacrifices for the people and for himself. He, he, he could do it um, and he had to make sure he was pure and he was holy. That curtain that kept everybody else out, to let nobody else see what was back there, that curtain was torn in two because Jesus, the great high priest, our forerunner, has gone behind the curtain, has gone behind. He has gone behind the curtain and ripped it in half, opening the way for us to have a relationship with God. We no longer have to go through a, a priest an earthly priest, because we have a great high priest who is in heaven. We have Jesus, the king, who for once and for all has paid for sins, who has made a way for you to have a relationship with God, regardless of what you have done, because he paid it all. Brothers and sisters, the theology of the cross makes me celebrate. The events of the cross make me contemplate and remember what God has done. But lastly, I want us to see Well, before we lastly, I want to see, I want to go ahead, I was going to go to lastly, but let's do this instead. In the same way, let's see verse 31. The chief priest who mocked him, he saved others, but he can't save himself. Oh, what an ironic statement. Oh, what an ironic statement. Was he saving others? Sure, he saved others, but absolutely he could have saved himself. In Matthew 26, Jesus said, do you not think that at once I can call on my father and he will put at my disposal 12 legions of angels? Jesus at any time could could have said enough, enough of the mocking, enough of the beating, enough of the flogging. I'm, I'm done with this. I've had a, I've had a hard night. I had a, people are falsely accusing me. Done. He could have stopped it at any moment. He could have put an end. But in the garden, he said, not my will, but yours be done, Father. When they beat him, I think he said the same thing. I want this to stop. And he absolutely had the power to stop it. But not my will, but the Father's. When they spit on him, when they put crowns of thorns, hail king of the Jews, oh. But he didn't. He stopped. It's not my will, but yours be done. When they were putting the, the, the nails in his hands and his feet, not my will but yours be done. At every point, he surrendered to the Father's will, and he could have brought down the legions of angels, but didn't. He suffered, and he fulfilled what God said in Isaiah 53. It said he was a despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering, familiar with pain, like one from whom we hide our faces. He was despised, and we held him in low esteem, but surely he took up our pain on that cross. He bore our suffering on that cross, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken and inflicted. Um, he was pierced for our transgressions, and, and he was crushed on that cross for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace with God, that tore the temple curtain in two, was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. Oh, we all, like sheep, have gone astray, each of us to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Isaiah 53 prophesied that the Son of God would come. He would bear our sorrows. He would bear our pains. He would bear our sins, our iniquities, and on that cross, Jesus paid them all. We, like sheep, have gone astray. But God took every one of your sins, past, present, future. He took them not only for you, but for the sins of the world and placed them on his son. And Jesus paid for them all. 
The Apostle Paul says it this way. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Don't miss the theology there. There was a great exchange. God took every bit of us, every bit of our sin, our weakness, our frailties, all the mistakes, all the errors, all the iniquities and things where we just said, God, you know what? I wish you would crucify your plans for me. Crucify your son. God, I don't want your will in my life. I'm choosing my way. He took all of that and let Jesus pay for those sins. So that in Jesus, we have his standing, his righteousness, his holiness is given to you. You didn't earn it, but you receive it by grace and you receive it by faith. You put your faith in the son of God and what he did on the cross counts for you. You appear before him righteous. Don't miss the theology of the cross this week. Don't miss that great exchange. Don't miss that incredible act of mercy. Don't miss. Well, don't miss the invitation of the cross. You see, there's not only these events, there's not only the theology and what Jesus accomplished in the cross, but there's also an invitation to you. In Luke chapter 9, way before the crucifixion had even happened, before the people even understood what Jesus was talking about, he said, whoever wants to be my disciple, whoever wants to follow me, whoever wants to, to, to have this life that God has, wants to give you, whoever is going to be my disciple, Jesus says, you must deny yourself. Take up your cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. We don't just come to Jesus and say, sure, sign me up. I'll take all that forgiveness. We come up and say, sign me up. My life now belongs to you. My life is now yours. I, I, I want to follow you. Oh, we fail. We fail many times. James in the, says we all sin, and the Greek word is pluta, a bunch. We all sin a lot. Uh, it can be many times or many ways, but it really just means a bunch. We all mess up, but we are called to daily take up our cross and follow him. Now, you've heard that phrase over and over again. Well, that's just the cross I have to bear, I guess. <clears throat> what are you talking about? I don't know. It's your wife, your kids, your job. I don't know. That's just the cross I got to bear. That's not what he's talking about. The cross is the surrendering of your life to him. Jesus, you get it all. You get it all. Take all to you I owe. Second Corinthians chapter 5 says, And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and was raised again. That's what baptism's about. That's why we do that symbol, because it says our lives in Christ Jesus, we died with him. My will, I'm trading for his will. There's a new life. My life belongs to you now. You took the old life. You paid for the old life. My old life deserved death, and it has died with you, and now my new life is with your resurrected truth living inside of me, your spirit making me alive, you leading me, you guiding me. This is the invitation. Come, follow How will you reflect? How will you commemorate this good Friday, this Easter Sunday, this holy week? For me, it's taking a chance to stop and remember what my Savior went through. To me, I've got to take a moment to think about all that, that Jesus accomplished, that, that this great transaction of taking my sins and giving me new life. For me, it's about saying yes, yes to Jesus. This life belongs to you. It's a rededication of myself to him. For you, what does this Easter week need to look like for you? Is it taking time to remember the cross? Is it our Good Friday service? Is it throughout the week reading the Gospel of John with us? Is it taking time each day to think about him? For some of you, 
it might begin today in a whole new way. You've been to church before. Yeah, I, I get it. Maybe you grew up in church. Maybe you've heard the story of Jesus again and again, but for some reason it clicked today. For some reason, it was like, wait a second. Wait, wait, wait. No, this is speaking to me. Wait, I have never said yes to Jesus. I have never asked him to forgive me. Uh, maybe you're a teenager. Maybe you're, maybe you're a young adult. Maybe you're uh, an older saint <laughs> among us. But you've never said yes to Jesus. You've never said, I, I need your death to count for me. Jesus, I belong to you. How do you need to respond to him? Today we're going to sing one last song that I want you to maybe be willing to do something different. Maybe stay seated where you are. Maybe come to the front, kneel at the altar. Maybe go and stand in the back or something. But whatever you need to do to just offer yourself and say, Jesus, I'm yours. If that's a, a rededication because you're a believer, you respond. Maybe if you're a new believer, because today you said, I want to follow Jesus. You just want to come up and let me know, let Pastor David know and say, look, I, I, I'm in. I need to follow you. You respond as God calls you. We're going to have one last song. The music team is going to lead us. And as we do, would you respond by just saying yes, yes to Jesus? Let's pray together. Father, thank you. Thank you for your plan that was so awful and so wonderful all at the same time. Thank you for sending your son who was obedient to death, even death on a cross. Thank you for his love for his people. Thank you for his love for us, that he would call us friends, that he would love us and show us the full extent of his love through the cross. Thank you that you loved us. God, help us. Help us love you back. Help us love the world and be agents of your love. Help us be those that, that, that show that you are alive, and that you are alive in us, that your death we embrace so that your life might flow freely and fully in us and through us. Father, come. Change your people today. Come as we respond to you. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. I invite you to stand if you would like to stand and sing. If you want to sit and sing, um, if you need to do business with the Lord, you do that. If you need to come to the altar and kneel or, or sit or pray or, 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 or stand up front or speak to me or David, you come, you respond. The Father's love for us How vast beyond all measure That He should give His only Son To make a wretch His treasure How great the pain of searing loss The Father turns His face away Has wounds which mar the chosen one Bring many sons to glory Ashamed, I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. 
It was my sin that held him there Until it was accomplished His dying breath has brought me life I know that it is finished I will not boast in anything No gifts, no power, no wisdom but I will boast in Jesus Christ, His death and resurrection. Why should I gain from His reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. Why should, why should I gain from His reward? I cannot give an answer. But this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. And you may be seated. Today, if the Lord is speaking to you, and maybe you haven't quite got all this figured out, and, and the good news of Jesus, this death and resurrection, and all this kind of stuff, and you're like, there's something there, but I don't understand it. Don't let today slip away without grabbing a believer. Myself, Pastor David, one of the Sunday school leaders, uh, Bible study leaders, just pull them aside and say, how do I have this? I, I need Jesus in my life. I need this forgiveness. I need this new life. Don't let today pass. Don't let today pass. Rachel's going to give us uh, some announcements about what's going on this week for Holy Week and for today. Well, good morning, Valley. Um, I just wanted to start off really quickly by thanking you all so much for praying um, for us, for the Grace Life Ministry as we went down to Panama City Beach this last week. I missed you all, uh, and it's good to be back. Um, but I just wanted to thank you for praying, and I wanted to just encourage you um, by sharing that while we were there, we were with a group of nearly 500 other college students from, from around the country. And this past week, the gospel was shared with more than 3,000 college students who were celebrating spring break, having, you know, living their best life um, in, from their perspective. And um, out of those gospel conversations, 173 students made professions of faith crossed from death to life this past week. I say that to encourage you, but I also would implore you to continue praying because now begins the hard work of discipleship for those students as we got their contact information and they'll be followed up with in their local churches and on their campuses. Um, but it now, now begins the hard work. Um, and so I, can, I would ask you to continue praying um, for those students who made, who considered the invitation and said yes this week. So thank you. Um, I have some announcements, some ways to continue to fellowship together this week. Uh, first, as always, there's um, multiple ways to give. Um, you can give online or in the black box with envelopes um, here and in the back if you would like to join us in that way. Of course, it's Easter, and so for uh, this month of March, we're also doing an Easter missions offering. That will be separate and on the envelope. You can indicate that you would like to give toward the Easter offering. Um, we're partnering with three ministries for our Easter offering. First is the Salam Center of Baltimore, then East Baltimore Graffiti Church, and also Caleb Russell has just started um, with Transworld Radio and is fundraising for that. And so if you'd like to um, indicate that you would like your offering to go to the Easter offering, this will be split evenly between those three ministries. If you have more questions, you can talk to me or anyone on the missions team. Wednesday night, uh, we'll be having dinner on April 3rd at 6 p.m. Um, you can register 
online on the website or through the newsletter or kind of up front at that welcome desk where the name tags are. Um, this is not a potluck. And so uh, some volunteers will be cooking for anyone, for everyone that comes. And so be sure to register so we make enough food. Um, you can see Mike right here if you have questions about that. Um, and that's if you're willing to help with setup and tear down, you can talk to him. Uh, Christine, you still looking for people that are wanting to sing on Easter? All right, excellent. Christine is um, continuing to put together a choir for Easter Sunday. So, you know, if you would like to serve in that way, if you'd like to participate, make sure to see Christine after the service. you got one week <laughs> to, uh, to practice and be ready for that. So um, if God has put that on your heart, be sure to talk to her um, if you would like to make a joyful noise to the Lord. This Friday, we are having a Good Friday service at 7 p.m., um, it's going to be just a time of worship, and um, then we'll go straight from that into a regular Friday night activities, I believe. Um, so be sure, be sure to come out uh, 7 p.m. this Friday for our Good Friday service. There will be a celebration of life for Edith Higgs on Saturday, April 13th at 12 p.m. Um, for, for those who knew her, come for a time to celebrate and remember, and remember Edith who passed away in January. Today, we have Bible studies following the service. We have four options, uh, Valley Basics that Mike will be leading in room 208, 210, uh, Discipleship Journey um, that Mike uh, York will be leading in the Heritage Room right over here, Men Looking in a Mirror that Nate and Calvin are leading in room 211, that's the one back by the gym, and then Praying God's Word by Beth Moore that uh, Vicki will be leading today in 207, 209 outside the hall. Um, and then there will also be children's and youth classes available. Tonight, we'll have a time of prayer at 6 p.m. in the foyer. Pickleball, as Mike mentioned, is not happening this week, um, and so don't, don't come out tomorrow, but we will resume next week. We'd love to have you for that. Wednesday evening, we have our virtual prayer meeting at 7 p.m., which you can find the link for on the website or in the bulletin. ACTC food collection on Thursday at 5, and then Fridays at Valley. We, are, um, as I mentioned, we're having Good Friday service this week, so there will be no youth group. Um, but we will have a time of worship, and then we'll head straight into volleyball, board games, a time of fellowship uh, following the service, so we'd invite you to join us for that. So if you don't have to run off, please do stay and join us for Bible study this morning. Um, so let me, let me pray for us and as we head into this. Father, I just thank you for the gift of your Son. God, I thank you for the gift of fellowship that we have with other believers who profess um, that Christ is our King. Uh, God, I thank you for students who made that commitment for the first time this week and who will celebrate Easter in a whole new way uh, next Sunday. And so, God, I just uh, pray that you would be doing a work in all of our hearts to draw us nearer to yourself, to <laughs> that we would be willing to just surrender our lives daily to the call that you've placed on us. God, I pray for a time in Bible study that you would just open up your word, um, that you would soften our hearts and our minds to the truths that you would have to teach us. And God, and I pray um, that as we come together again and again this week to, to celebrate um, just the new life that we have in you, that you made a way on the cross and demonstrated your power over death in the resurrection. God, I pray that that truth would not grow old to us, but that it would be just new every morning, that we would be just a people who rejoice um, in the new life that we have in Christ. So God, I just thank you um, for this morning. I just pray that you got our time. I ask these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. You are dismissed. having mine actually.